Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. We're delighted to introduce Mark Hamer, our Vice President of Global Customer Transformation at ServiceMax, and Chris Ormond, Editor of Field Service News. Uh, a few housekeeping rules before we begin. All lines should be on mute, but we want this to be as interactive as possible, so please post your questions to the panel in the chat box um, at the top of your window, and we'll take those questions at the end. Uh, the session will also be recorded, and we'll be sharing the file in the next few days. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's session. Uh, we have two um, very knowledgeable speakers on this topic. Um, so without further ado, I will pass to uh, Mark and Chris. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Um, so just a brief introduction for myself. My name is Chris Oldman. I'm the editor of Field Service News, and uh, I was uh, heavily involved in this research project, uh, putting together the questions and pulling together the analysis across the, the reports and white papers you know see on Field Service News. And for me, it was an absolute no-brainer for us to look at IoT as a topic for research. It's one of the biggest talked about uh, technologies at any conference that we've seen across the last year. Um, I get a number of service directors and uh, vice presidents of service asking me uh, questions around service on a regular basis. Um, where can IoT fit? Um, is it all high or is it actually something that's really happening? So, fantastic to be involved in this research. Thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, Mark, uh, Tell us a little bit about your input from this as well. Thanks, Chris. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here to join the two Chrises. This is actually our first broadcast from our new offices in London in uh, Covent Garden. Um, I spend a lot of time working with prospects and customers to really help them understand the value of field service. Um, service Max has been around for coming up to a decade now. Um, it's been recognised by Gartner as being one of the leaders in the, in the quadrant. Um, we've got a pretty much a very large following, 500 plus customers across 12 sectors. And to your point, we are seeing a lot of interest in IoT. Uh, you may have seen our announcement um, a few months back about our partnership with PTC, and that has grown a huge amount of interest. So again, delighted to be part of this research. I think it's a really exciting time to be in field service. Um, it's an incredible advancement that we're seeing. And uh, I think the field service industry has been touched by a lot of this new technology. So I'm um, really, really excited. Customers are adopting mobile and cloud technologies, and I think uh, the whole IoT space is, is really growing. So I think let's talk a little bit about the sort of the landscape. So if I can spend a few moments to set the scene and sort of talk a little bit about the trends that I'm seeing. So I'm, we're definitely seeing from the organizations that I'm working with uh, a, a growing interest and a move from reactive service from the perspective of both the customer and from the service providers. Um, reactive service, as we all know, has been very expensive and, in my opinion, doesn't really deliver the quality and the, the value that it should do. And I think from a customer's point of view, you know, the reactive service costs, particularly related to downtime and lost output, really are, are significant. So I think IoT offers some potential solutions, and this is what we're looking to get from the research today. I think also from a supplier's point of view, you know, it's always been expensive to roll a truck to send a technician out. Yeah, of course. Um, sort of 180 odd pounds, I suppose, is, is the sort of the typical sort of charge for sort of a B2B time model. And even in consumer electronics, the B2C model, it's around 80 pounds to send a technician out. And of course, some of our organisations that we work with, you know, that are maintaining gas plants or very expensive equipment, maybe security scanners, you know, it could be anything up to 1,500 pounds to send out. So I think um, I've been really impressed by the, um, the, the response. And there's a few surprises in there, which obviously we're going to uncover. Um, to give a little bit of context as well, you know, we've, we've seen a shift to the connected services. We, we um, have a quite a lot of interest um, in certification. Um, we've been running a few webinars and sessions that are user group about certification. And um, servitization has really been around for a while. It, it sort of came out of uh, lean manufacturing and um, Six Sigma. And as a result of that, you know, with sort of the drive to globalization and digitalization, this move, this force of IoT, has really brought servitization into the fold, particularly the service industry, uh, particularly around this idea of outcome-based service models. And I think a lot of our organizations that we work with are basically seeing IoT as an enabling technology 
Uh, hence, this is why the research was commissioned with the field service used. Um, also, by way of a little bit of background, um, we've included a reference to an article that was written by our partner PTC, um, Jim Hamilton and Professor Michael Porter. And that's, again, I would encourage the uh, people joining this particular session um, to really look at that article. It came out in the Harvard Business Review. It's actually one of two white papers. And what they've, they've done is picked up on some of the McKinsey research about 6.2 trillion in global economic value generated by this trend over the next 10 years. And it's interesting that Gartner also states that the manufacturing industry, you know, this is potentially IoT is going to be one of the greatest sort of value adds. So, as I mentioned, I think we really have to rethink our service models and outcome-based service models particularly are becoming more common. And I know that um, you know, in many high-profile case studies, um, we did uh, quite a lot of research with these organizations. And I suspect they've been talked about in quite a number of different forums. Mm -hmm. uh, the classic ones are sort of the Rolls-Royce, this idea of power by the hour. You, know, you pay as an outcome, so the airline pay as an outcome for the engine uptime. Um, we've also got our clients, Sungevity, which are installing solar panels, and they're offering 30-year contracts for solar energy, and they're actually doing the monitoring and the support. And the classic ones for like GE and Canon as well, a lot of people have seen sort of document services, this sort of B2B idea where printing can bother you, and they're basically servitizing that whole proposition. So I think, in summary, customers are looking for a guarantee that you're going to provide a particular service, a particular outcome, and a level of performance. And the change in the industry is very much, it's almost like we're going to be in it together with our customers, accountable for their business success. And I think service is the absolute core to this. So really, with these sort of moving changes, um, this is really why the relationship with PTC, um, as I said, we announced our partnership with them, but together we're delivering this combined platform to support this new service economy. So really allowing manufacturers, uh, service partners to connect products, connect smart assets. And if you look at this platform, this is quite a, a good diagram really. It talks about sort of obviously the mobile and cloud piece, but really what ServiceMax is all about, this end-to-end -end sort of process of managing your processes, so basically defining the business process for your service organization, connecting your products, the install base, so getting visibility of the assets that are actually out there and the health of those assets, and then managing sort of the trunk stock, you know, the, the path. And of course, making sure we keep to our promises, the SLA. So it's a really quite a end-to-end -end sort of full piece, really looking at the whole sort of proposition about managing the technicians, the people, and scheduling the right technicians to service. Sorry, so we just had a comment there with no sound. Would it be better if we do the channel? Hi, sorry, there was a little bit of a, a sound delay. Um, we just uh, switched mics. So hopefully this is setting the scene. I'll just show um, an example of an end-to-end -end process. This is something that we presented at the recent PTC event in Stuttgart. It's the end-to-end -end connected field service play that we did with our partners, uh, PTC, for a customer called Schneider Electric, which is a, a French energy manufacturing company. Um, hopefully this will set the scene for the research findings. So Chris, can you perhaps give us some background on the research and perhaps walk us through the results? Absolutely. So um, we, we spoke to 110 service leaders um, which were interviewed across uh, initially both online and we found out we were speaking to these guys to refine some of the results. These uh, representatives came from 20 different countries um, including as far afield as Mexico, Malaysia, um, and of course, closer to home, the United Kingdom, the USA, uh, as well as core European countries such as the Nordic regions, France and Germany. We wanted to get a really broad feel for this. Um, we didn't want to just pigeonhole IoT with enterprise. As we've seen from some of the examples that Mark gave us just now, there are some big names like Rolls-Royce, like General Electric, that we're seeing uh, examples of and that are associated with the Internet of Things and, and being pioneers. However, there's also a lot of smaller companies doing some really exciting stuff around IoT, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. But we looked at bringing in senior business leaders or service leaders for companies that had ranging from less than 10 right through to those enterprise companies with 800 or more field engineers. As I mentioned, the, the target 
reference audience and the demographic that we were speaking to were very much director level. So some of the names that we were seeing there were field service directors, senior vice presidents of service, but we also reached out to CEOs, uh, CFOs and CTOs. And I think that's important because IoT and IoT implementations and the possible impact for the Internet of Things on field service isn't just about the technology, it's not just about the service, and it's not just about the potential savings. It really does sit across all three of these areas as a business implementation. So it's important that we've got that spread across the business unit. What we were looking to assess very simply was the appetite for the Internet of Things. How interested were companies doing it? How much was uh, the hyperbole? You know, IoT was sat right at the top of the Gartner hype cycle when we uh, undertook this. Uh, research project. So how much was hyperbole, how much was reality? And actually, how much is it talk about future talk, and how much is it about actual real-life implementations that are being undertaken in the here and now? Finally, the research was undertaken throughout September and October 2015. So it's relatively recent that we've got this result. So we're seeing these results now of a real uh, capture and snapshot of where the market is today. So as we move across throughout the research, let's have a look at some of the key themes. So some of the themes that came out from the research and having studied the, the facts and figures and put together a, a white paper looking at these results, we saw we wanted to look at IoT's role in the future of field service. I think as Mark touched on in the introduction, um, it's a fundamental technology that has the potential to really change the way we approach service, um, but also to change the way we approach business. Civitization is a key trend that's driving forward, and IoT is a fundamental enabler in, uh, in allowing companies to move into that space. We also looked at the shift from reactive to proactive. Um, again, the traditional break-fix model is an expensive model. If we can move towards preventative maintenance, then that is, again, a, an enabler that can allow companies to be more effective, more efficient in their service. We also looked at IoT and other technologies. Where does it fit in terms of the appetite? And is IoT an uh, option for companies of all sizes? Finally, comp competitive advantage, and um, we'll touch on what to do next in a moment. But let's dive a little bit further into some of these answers and see some of these questions, have a look at some of these findings. So first of all, IoT's role in field service. We asked our respondents, what are your thoughts of the Internet of Things, and how can it be implemented in field service? Now. We gave our respondents four options here, whether they saw it as critical, fundamental, interesting, or whether they didn't see it as having an impact on field service at all. As you can see from the slide, the results were quite uh, resounding, with just 3% of our respondents feeling that the Internet of Things didn't have a place in field service. I think, personally, what's absolutely fascinating here is if, if we kind of marry the last two categories together there, we're seeing three quarters of our respondents that 76% are stating that they feel that the Internet of Things is either fundamental or critical to the future of field service. Meanwhile, a, further, a fifth of the other respondents still felt it was very interesting. And as I drilled down into those results, it was a case of many of those that opted to say it was interesting felt that it was a case that it wasn't quite at maturation. So as studies like this come to the fore, I think we'll see even more people being involved in, in that question. Um, Mark, do you have any, any thoughts on that initial findings? How, how did they sit with your own conversations? I'm actually not surprised by the results. They're very much in line with some of the research I've seen from other parties, um, very similar to the CIO forums that I recently attended. Um, it's what's really interesting is sort of the term IoT as well is a little bit misleading because it's not so much the internet part, it's the expanding capability of things that's really interesting and so obviously the resulting business cases and customer value enablement. So um, yeah, very much in, in line with, uh, with, with what I've seen at you know, other places. Okay, so let's take a, a step forward then and let's look further into the results. The results. Now, the next question we wanted to ask of our, our um, respondents of our audience was to understand whether they were actively using the internet, um, currently their, their field service processes, whether they were working on a reactive or proactive manner. Of course, the reason why we wanted to ask this question, again, it sits back a little bit with that, that move away from the traditional break-fix approach towards 
um, a more preventative approach and an approach that can lead towards outcome-based solutions and, and that servitization approach. If companies are able to work in a proactive manner, they can be that much more productive, they can be that much more efficient, they can be that much more organized. However, IoT as a core uh, tool is something that can really help companies move from one place to another. So it's important for us to get a feel for how these companies sat. So actually, when we look at the results, we see that whilst 4% are purely reactive, uh, whilst 6% are mostly pro fully proactive, actually, most companies sit in this, this region at, at the center. You know, I either have a proactive strategy but still have some reactive calls or a half and half proactive and reactive. Um, what that said to me personally was that the, this concept of moving away from break fix and moving towards a proactive strategy is very much um, something that companies are grasping, companies are moving forwards towards. However, um, it's not as easy as it is to make a decision in the boardroom to say, right, we're going to move to a proactive approach. You know, um, currently, we could have a preventative maintenance schedule that sees an engineer go out and visit a machine every month as part of an SLA, but that machine may not have been touched for, since the last, uh, last time the engineer was out. Um, it's a waste, of a, a waste of an engineer's time. Um, however, it could be that he gets a call from a, a, a company further down the road and has to react. If we have sensor-based um, uh, assets in the field, then obviously that becomes a lot easier. So IoT is a very important part of this move towards a preventative maintenance, proactive strategy. Mark, I can see you're, you're nodding your head there as I'm kind of talking through this. I mean, what, what, what's your thinking there? Again, it's quite interesting, really, because a lot, well, some organizations have been doing condition-based monitoring for, for years. You know, they've, they've had the ability to, through telematics and what have you, to dial in and collect data. You know, and in some industries, particularly in the B2B space, you know, I'm thinking about business machines, they've been collecting data like counters, usage information for, for years. But again, I think it's, um, yeah, not surprising. Um, and again, it's what we talked about at the beginning of the session. You know, it's this cost issue. If we can start planning our work and getting a better visibility of the health of our assets, you know, by monitoring their condition, their usage, you get deeper, into, deeper insights into the customer use. So really combining sort of service data, warranty data with machine data, you then get an opportunity really to plan your work and all the costs start to fall. You know, if you know what you're going to do and you can service just in time or just at the right time, you can plan that part and that whole fulfillment thing. So, yeah, again, endorsing really what we, our, probably our gut feel was before we finish in the research. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the, some of the responses here for the, uh, um, the research, some of the responses have come out, are given us that kind of that, that endorsement, I think it's the correct word, um, there, there are some... Uh, statements and assertions that we, we kind of take for granted around IoT, but it's, um, it's good to see the market actually responding to that. Now, I mentioned a wee bit earlier the, the hyperbole around uh, Internet of Things. Um, it, it was interesting that at the, at the time that we launched this data, well, currently as well, um, IoT sits at the top of that hype cycle. Although at the same time, it's very interesting that on that same Gartner's hype cycle, big data has come away from it. In fact, they've pulled it away. So it's interesting to see whether the uh, technologies, uh, whether Internet of Things was as, uh, as attractive to our wider audience as the media is portraying it. So we asked them, now, which technologies do you think will have the biggest impact on field service operations within the next five years? And the interesting results were, were, were again, very, very illuminating. You know, the slide says it all. Um, a huge, huge response for in Internet of Things there. Um, and these, that sat alongside some very, very interesting and very exciting uh, technologies as well. You know, we look at connected vehicles. The connected vehicle is going to have a huge impact on the way field service companies operate because whilst our engineer's full-time role is, of course, fixing uh, and maintaining the assets in the field, the car that they're, they're, they're using to get there um, will become an office almost, you know. Um, so the connected vehicle, very important. Augmented reality, another topic that... Um, I think perhaps if we ran this again next year, I think augmented reality would probably be sitting a little bit higher up there. We'll start to see some really nice chain, um, products coming to the fore, uh, and there's some really interesting conversation about what AR can do with field service. Um, smart glasses, I think that's, again, perhaps 
a perception was the, uh, the ill-fated uh, Google Glass beta program. Um, and perhaps sitting alongside augmented reality there, those two will combine. And big data has become pervasive already. Perhaps it's not as tangible. We don't really see big data. It kind of happens in the background. And I think that's why IoT is so um, engaging in terms of the technology with non-tech people as well as um, the, tech, uh, the IT specialists. We can see how IoT is going to impact on food field service. We can see how it's going to change our business results. Um, so I think it's no surprise there um, that IoT is the leader. I think what actually probably surprised me a little bit was by the magnitude. To see just shy of half of our respondents identifying Internet of Things as the biggest, uh, the technology that's going to have the biggest impact on field service really was. Um, it was it was a resounding uh, answer that kind of endorsed the the power of the Internet of Things. I mean, Mark, would you have said 50% before this survey? I'm actually quite shocked by that. I mean, big data has been in the hype curve for a while. Um, you know, it is settling down a little bit. Uh, and I think I totally agree with your point. Your IoT is far more tangible. I think people get that, understand it. Um, what was really interesting was also at the uh, recent Gartner event, they were talking a lot about the algorithmic economy, so this idea that you know, data is relatively dumb, but it's what you do with that data, how you get those business insights. I think that's the bit that's really exciting us about blending this data you can get from the field with the information that you already hold in probably in your silos. And there's a lot of information that comes from the service technicians in terms of the, you know, the warranty, the history, the maintenance, you know, in terms of the uh, maintenance bill of materials, that sort of information. And I think it's blending all of that which gives you that ability to do the predictive, you know, the view ahead, and sometimes the prescriptive piece as well, where you can perhaps tune the, the particular asset, the smart asset or the device, to um, eke that little bit more performance. So yeah, very interesting, and as I said, the point really, the IoT, that, that over big data was quite a surprise. Yeah, I suppose the, the other point to kind of bear in mind before we move on to the next slide there is, is of course, IoT is fundamentally powered by um, big data as well. It's almost you need one to have the other. Uh, you know, as, as you say there, Mark, the prescriptive stuff, you know, um, the ability to be able to take data from the assets in the field and then to apply a big data approach across that to find what those best practices are. How do we get that optimum performance? What are the best settings? That, that's a very important part to combine those. And I think, in one sense, um, was, was of course, it's important to look at these technologies in isolation and see the value they bring. Um, it's also very important to kind of look at where we are uh, in the wider ecosystem of technology and field service. Um, you know, the, the fact that we've got the mobility tools, cloud-based computing, big data, and IoT all coming together really are in a perfect storm for technology to push forward how we, we operate our field service unit. However, I could, I could carry on about that topic for a while, so let's look at the next section of our results. Now, one of the areas I touched on again at the beginning is, is we see the, the, the case studies of Rolls-Royce's Power by the Hour or Caterpillar or General Electric. Um, however, I did mention, you know, I've seen some very, very good use cases of IoT for smaller companies. I wanted to see if that was reflected across our audience. So we asked them, do you think that the IoT is accessible to companies of all sizes? Again, the results here were quite uh, resounding. As you can see from the slide, again, three quarters of our respondents stated that they felt that IoT wasn't restricted by company size. In fact, it was accessible to companies of all sizes. Um, it's interesting to just to give a, a little bit of uh, further insight here, uh, whilst I was kind of drilling down and looking through these respondents and, and, and kind of speaking to the, the uh, people that we were speaking to on this research. Um, of, of those that sat in the don't know camp, um, actually there's quite a few that were, were just very open and honest and said that they weren't sure, they hadn't explored it, um, it wasn't so much a resounding no as well. So I think as, again, the, the education comes to the fore in the market, um, as reports like this come to the fore, as the use cases start to come to the fore and, and the case studies that you'll see on publications like Field Service News, 
I think, again, we'll start to see that, that yes column grow even further. Um, Mark, have you, yourselves uh, work with a number of different companies from different sizes. Um, your point here? Absolutely. I think it's applicable to all sides of business, and we've actually included um, a case study. There's, there's actually a lot of case study material from our customers on YouTube and, and Wikipedia as well. So if, um, I think we'll send the link out as a follow-up to uh, this webinar. But this is um, Enthize Energize company. They are a company that basically deploys solar panels, and they put the inverter underneath each of the panels, so they actually can have visibility of the output of each panel. And it allows them to offer a very new service that can be very proactive with the customer. But it's, I won't spoil the, the video for you. Please take a look. It's a really great story. And to the point, it shows that you know, organizations of all size you know, can get a competitive advantage by actually looking at you know, integrating IoT with the service management platform. Absolutely. And it's, I mean, it, it's fascinating that it doesn't necessarily need to be high tech either. Um, it's, it's something else that I would, I would add to that. Um, I've seen case studies of, of cow feed um, being improved and enhanced uh, for the use of IoT um, and companies being able to improve their productivity, improve their customers' uh, perception of how the service they're delivering, but also give their customers more value as well. So it's one of the things that really comes through with the Internet of Things and the case studies that we see, whether it be you know, the, the classics, whether it be American Airlines saying to Rolls-Royce, look, we want you to go down this route, um, or whether it be small, innovative companies kind of thinking outside of the box, what we do see is a win-win where um, the provider is able to deliver the, the goods and services at a more efficient rate, and the, com the, the company that's receiving those goods and services are getting a more efficient service, and they're getting a, a, a better cost per item. Um, of course, we, that kind of leads us towards the final question here. Um, do you think that companies who become early adopters of IoT will gain a competitive advantage? Again, I was interested to see the response here because having looked at and spoken with and seen a number of uh, small cases, large cases of where IT, where IoT has led, um, and, and before the Internet of Things, of course, we were just calling machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communications, um, I think there is a strong leaning here, but it was very interesting to see uh, what the response of our service directors and our panel of uh, business leaders would be saying. So let's have a look at that response. And again, the, the results of the survey doing my job really for me here, um, completely overwhelming response. And I thought what's really interesting here is, is you know, with any technology coming to the fore, um, we tend to see bleeding edge early adopters. Then we tend to see the majority of companies moving there, and we'll see the laggards. Um, with IoT, it seems almost like a race for companies to become these, uh, to become the, the early adopters. I think this is really interesting when we compare this to, say, um, the adoption of cloud-based systems in field service management solutions. Um, we've recently did some research around cloud-based uh, adoption, and we would see perhaps um, 23, 26% now um, of companies moving towards the cloud. However, underneath that headline statistic, there's a, a very strong traction for companies wanting to move to the cloud. But what really, when we put that against this information here, what that really says to me is IoT, again, it's tangible. It has very clear physical uh, impact upon how a field service unit can operate how companies can get the benefits and what those benefits are, not just for the field service division, but also for the business as a whole. Um, Mark, what, what do you think on that? Do you think I've got the right thinking? Absolutely, Chris. I think for the field service industry, unlocking the triggers and the alerts has become the foundation of new capabilities and you know, for basic for product and asset optimization. Monitoring and predictive maintenance is going to really develop a whole new proposition for customers. Um, I mentioned Schneider. I mean, again, I've had sort of the, the pleasure of working with, with those teams, and they're doing some incredible things with IoT to drive subscription-based services, subscription-based contracts, and they're looking at a whole upsell services, increasing the uptime by predicting when the products will fail, and enabling those remote diagnostics that we just talked about. So I think their whole connected the loop model is enabling their IoT data to be blended, as we talked about before, the information we already hold 
most service businesses have got a lot of detail about their customer and their use of the products. And it's really completely revolutionizing the way that they can look at servicing those customers and, and offering, as I said, new products and, and a whole new generation of service. So yeah, absolutely agree with those. Of course, the big question now for um, those companies that are uh, either dialing in uh, live as we speak or picking up this uh, webinar on, on a download basis um, is what to do next. I think the results, as we've seen, clearly allude to um, most field service organizations should at the very least be exploring what IoT can do for their business, how they can implement it. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass you back to Mark. And I think, Mark, this is, this is your ballpark. So what, what should we be doing next? I think the big message really is it's not an, a spectator sport. You know, IoT is not a spectator sport. You need to get your head in the game. And again, what's really interesting from some of the panel discussions and the workshops that I've been on, you know, I asked the question, who's leading your digital initiative you know, in organizations? And, and what's fascinating is, is that in a recent survey that Gartner ran, they were saying, I think of 400 you know, CEOs, excluding some of the technology companies, that on the CEO's agenda, you know, and the company sort of plans goals, they are actually putting technology in there and the whole digitalization sort of strategy. So when you start seeing that in, you know, in, in underpinning growth and you start seeing it on CIO agendas, I think service leaders need to really sort of raise their head and say, we need to get in the game. And I think it's very much, you know, encouraging service leaders to actually start looking and experimenting, you know. And I would say, you know, it's relatively easy to get started. You know, you can buy these kits, you know, the Arduino boards, and, and, some, and there's some very low-cost kits, under 100 euros, certainly, where you can experiment and do some very simple things just to educate and get some experience. Um, what's no doubt is that there's going to be some new skills needed and the new technology, new process, and new organizations. Uh, and there's help and support. I mean, as an organization, ServiceMax is here to support our customers, our prospects. You know, we I'm part of the transformation team. That's what we do. We, we come out and we can talk about you know, the maturity of an organization and talk about their goals and objectives. So I would very much encourage everyone to get in the game, start thinking on the strategy, you know, which set of capabilities should a company pursue, you know, how much functionality would you perhaps embed into the product, you know, get talking to your R&D. And sometimes it's not physical sensors. You can also derive data, virtual sensors, if that makes sense. You know, you, we, we, as I said, we're already collecting things like counter information in, in some instances. So there are some considerations around, you know, should it be a closed system or an open system? You know, should you use the internet? And obviously for some organizations like facilities management companies, you know, they've got to think about, you know, how they actually collect data. And should that processing be done in the building or should it be done in the cloud? But uh, again, you know, our partners have got lots of different options and there are different sort of models available. Um, I think the whole sort of be careful strategy, you know, things just to think about and just be a little bit cautious is, again, I come back to the business case, the business thing. Be careful about adding value to products that customers perhaps don't want to pay for. Um, just because there's a feature is possible, it's sometimes not you know, a value reason to do it. So again, it's, it's coming back, you know, service leaders being part of that value proposition, sitting down with R&D, with product management, and working out what's the benefit. And perhaps designing in IoT capability, designing it into product management for servicing, for ease of servicing, and talking about this whole serviceization, outcome-based approach. So understanding the business proposition for me is probably the biggest thing. And there's always the security and the privacy risks that have to come up. So be aware and get advice and consider how security works, how the gateways work. And again, we can talk more about that probably in the Q&A. And I think the biggest risk is actually failing to anticipate the competitive threat. And that, for me, probably is another big message is, you know, sometimes it's not from traditional sources where you get the competition. It's sometimes from other parts. You know, look at Google Nest, for example. You know, that's quite a surprise to the HVAC industry. So I would say waiting too long to get started is probably something you've got to be cautious of. So the key message is really, I think, is, you know, get going, get educating if you're not. And for those organizations that are already experimenting, you know, we're here to help. And um, I think the other sort of small thing to think about is sometimes overestimation of internal capabilities is something to, to watch as well. You know, what we're seeing with IIT is a lot of organizations working together to provide strategies and solutions. Uh, and indeed, we've got a great partnership with PTC and a very close working relationship with them. Any comments there? 
Yeah, um, I mean, actually, let, let's have a, a little focus there on, on that partnership with PTC. Um, I mean, this is something I talk about quite a lot um, in business is the move towards uh, an ecosystem. So having a, a number of partners working together, uh, if it's something that we hear quite a lot about in terms of servitization, you know, um, having one, a number of companies kind of bring in together to work in, in a much more holistic manner than perhaps before. Um, and I, I think in the Internet of Things as well, that, that's kind of something that is enabling that and empowering it, where we're seeing partnerships arise. Um, perhaps for a moment, you could just tell us a little bit more about the, the, the partnership with PTC and what, what, what that's kind of enabling in terms of how I, as a service director, if I came and knocked on your door, Mark, and said, look, I want to put together um, IoT solution, um, where, where, does the, where, where does that partnership feed into me? Well, it's very much, we start at the business case. We start at the customer, the business proposition, really, you know, the value to the customer. And as you said, there's so many moving parts, you know, there are the sensors, the gateways, there's collecting the data, there's all the protocols, telecommunications. And again, you know, some sensors aren't connected to the cloud. You know, they are collecting data locally and being processed on the edges they talk. So it's really about, you know, what sort of strategy is it monitoring? You know, are we monitoring and measuring a way a product or an asset is working in a deep way? Are we controlling that particular asset from remote control or remote diagnostics? Um, are we optimizing it in terms of product performance? Is there a new way of taking, you know, advantage of that remote control? And I think over time, as we see sensors you know, becoming lower cost, being combined with other sensors, and for technology to be aware of other technology, you know, we're very used to all of us, this ubiquitous UI, you know, if you log on to YouTube from a hotel room, you do it from your mobile phone, and the, you know, the, um, the, the, the TV automatically sort of picks up the channel. You know, it's this idea that you can move through different devices, different communication channels, and have these sort of ubiquitous movement. I think we're going to see that with products. So products are going to be more aware and, and ultimately going to be more autonomous, and they'll be able to do their own monitoring. They'll be able to request for service, request for parts, all this sort of stuff, and probably fine-tune themselves. So to answer the question, really, it's, it's many moving parts, many things to think about, and it's really just choosing partners that can introduce to their partner ecosystems and really have that collaborative type of discussion. But it does come down to the business case, ultimately. You know, what are we trying to achieve and, and what value is it of offering to the end customer? I think we can't, can't really have a conversation around IoT um, without raising up the, the elephant in the room that is always surfaced. Uh, feels like he follows me around most of the time. Um, the big question around security. Um, I mean, how how much is is security uh, an issue when we to, when, if we're connecting all of our devices, we're connecting all of our assets. You know, is, is it a real issue? Is it a, it's something that we really need to consider? Well, I think we all experience this every day. I mean, I think yes, there is a risk. Of course, there is. You know, no one can really say it's totally secure. But I think you have to design in from the very start. So. In general, you architect security in from the start. You know, you use people that understand secure gateways, understand encryption, understand protocols. And again, this is why choosing the partners that have done a lot of this integration is critical. You know, the way that our systems talk to each other is through APIs, you know, through methods of exchanging data. So again, the device and edge management is about locking those things down. So from the device and the sensors, it's ensuring that there's a persistent device identity. You know, it's crafting in the solution that there are automatic updates to the edge and they're storing as little information on the device as possible. You know, classic good practice, you know, when you're managing your own laptop, you know, you lock it down, you put a password on it. Um, so it's making the devices relatively difficult to access. And then from the cloud side, you know, the big advantage that ServiceMaster has got is built on the Salesforce One platform. So our security and cloud is, is provisioned, you know, and, and so far it's been excellent. So it's delivering that multi-tenant cloud infrastructure and isolating the Internet of Things traffic from the regular traffic, so if you can do that. And then really it's establishing some sort of comprehensive network monitoring. I guess what I'm saying is this is all known, really, and it's all doable. And, you know, we talk about IoT, but there are a lot of organizations that are already practicing this. And we've had some of this technology around for a long time. You think about the ODB devices in your vehicles, you know, sort of a lot of service uh, departments use uh, GPS tracking and, you know, so we've been doing this for a while, so I think some of the things are known, but you're absolutely right, you know, 
security, just design it in, architect it in. And as I mentioned before, new skills, new technologies, you know, there's going to be a need for a new organization within a lot of CIOs organizations to support the service teams. One of the um one of the things that I always kind of struggle to get my head around a little bit is, is around retrofitting, should we say, devices that are out there. Um, if, if I was a service director with you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of assets in the field that, that aren't connected, does that mean that I, I'm, I've kind of locked myself in? How easy is it to retrofit a device to get my assets, my existing assets out there to be connected? I mean, is it a case of if it's got a button, we can monitor it? Yeah, no, that's an interesting one. So again, it's down to the business proposition. You know, does it make sense to retrofit? There are lots of technologies out there now. There are lots of manufacturers. Again, I mentioned the PTC conference. There was lots of suppliers there offering sort of custom boards that are already available. And some of these boards have already got five or six sensors. Um, there was a great example of downloading the Thingworks client onto a mobile phone and taking advantage of the sensors in the mobile. You know, so I think again, business case first, but yet yeah, there are you know retrofit kits out there which actually aren't that expensive. I think actually hooking up the device is not that hard, and you know if you can prove the business case through some R and D, some research, then really to get that built and obviously the economies of scale, you know, play then. But it's it's lending the data and figuring out you know the algorithms or the analytics to actually drive the reason why you're doing the remote monitoring. Um, but I think very quickly we're seeing you know, R&D teams talking to service leaders and actually figuring out they're building this sort of technology, building this capability in. And as the costs come down, I mean, you come to the classic thing a lot, this is radio technology. You know, the thing with radio technology is it's, it's all about the frequency, the battery supply, and the range, the, the eternal tri triangle of radio technology. Um, but sometimes it's, you know, it's hardwired, hard connected as well. So I think it's uh, business case first talking to the right partners, doing some tests, doing some field trials, and then you know, then looking at what we can do and then, uh, then productizing that and making it low cost. Is there a, um, is there a specific skill set that's missing in the organization in terms of that? If we mentioned that this needs, um, we, we mentioned that this, we, we should be really bringing together you know, I, IT service operations business. Is, is there a, a, should there be an IoT director in, embedded in a company? Great question. Um, so we're seeing a lot of organisations. There was the sort of the rise of the chief digital officer, you know, and digital strategy. Um, I think it's you've got to really look at you know who understands the business. So I think the sort of the service teams and the service leaders really need to define what they're looking for service. But it, it's a mix of disciplines. You're absolutely right. I think there are some new skills emerging, absolutely in terms of security and sort of cyber protection. But we're also seeing sort of the rise of the data analysts or you know sort of data science. I think if I were to give anybody sort of going into university some advice now, it's probably consider data science because I think if you go down that route you can have a very good, you know, very good life. Um, I think that's you know emerging. And I think you know if you look at Gartner's predictions about the algorithmic economy, it's very much about, you know, writing things and uh, writing queries and writing analytics and doing algorithms to, to collect data to do interesting things with them. Bringing this back to field service, you know, it's all about predictability and looking at how we can perhaps blend you know, resource availability, optimizing our preventative maintenance, and basically getting as much information out to the field technicians in advance. You know, we've, we've got products, uh, Product IQ is one of the service mesh products, which gives the technician visibility of the health of that particular asset before they even turn, you know, turn up. Mm -hmm. And the augmented reality type things that we um, show some partner information and partner examples at our recent um, conference in Paris that was amazing, you know, some of the things that you could do even on an iPad was um, just incredible really on the, a, on the augmented reality front. So um, really interesting, really interesting times. Perfect, thanks so much um, Mark and Chris. We've got about five minutes left now. Um, we're just going to offer the opportunity again to um, take some questions. So please, if you have any questions from the audience, please just uh, post them in the, the Q&A box. Um, which you should see at the top of your screen. Um, we have had a couple of questions come in already. Um, so one is, uh, we've, we've touched on this already, but um, field service has a lot of priorities. So should IoT be top of the list? And who would like to go first, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Apps. 
Absolutely. I think, in my mind, if you're a service leader, you should be part of the digital initiative now. And if you're not, you need to uh, get yourself into that conversation. You know, working with colleagues and representatives from sort of marketing, product management, R and D, and engineering. Absolutely. And you know, to the point of retrofitting. You know, if you haven't got that internal infrastructure, you know, is look at that. And there's some really good case studies, and I encourage anybody to go out onto YouTube and look at some of the service max sort of case studies, the videos, because there's lots of success stories out there. Yeah, I'd, I'd very much echo that. Um, I think, as I kind of touched on a little bit earlier, it's it's important to kind of look at a number of the different technologies that are coming through. Um, you know, to look at some of these these technologies that are uh, coming together and, and looking at how they work together. So, how did IoT sit with um, the cloud? Sit with um, your, your big data structure, etc. But in terms of physical, actual, tangible benefits that we can see and the speed of those benefits, um, I think IoT is a real, real game changer for companies, absolutely. And another question uh, we've, we've had in from the audience is, so peaking five to ten years into the future, what excites you most about IoT um, potential and the impact of field, on field service? Oh, I get the best questions, don't I? We had um, a speaker, we had Kevin Ashton at our uh, Chief Service Officers, Officers event, CSO event, uh, which was just before our user group in Paris. And um, he was the guy, I think he's attributed as being the sort of grandfather or the father of the internet things. And he, I think he was at Procter & Gamble and he put RFID tags into lipsticks to basically you know, get a visualization of what stock was actually out in retailers. I'm obviously not going to sell many lipsticks unless all the colors are out. But it was fascinating, and he was asked the same question, so I'm, I'm going to probably crib a few things, a few ideas from him, really. I think it's, it's all about the growth of data from these connected assets. It's all about understanding the install base and the customers, and these new analytics, these new business insights are going to then give us these actionable triggers, and that's going to really revolutionize IoT. So I'd say in the next 10 years, yes, we're expecting... You know, we talked about Google Glass, Chris. You used to talk about Google Glass. Well, it's interesting, but there's some there's some industrial products coming through. I saw a brilliant product from Epson. You know, and it, it's it's heavy duty. It's got a long battery life. Yeah, it's probably not as pretty, but excellent, really. You know, and I, again, I'm talking about the AR. So I think we're going to see augmented reality, virtual reality type things for training and for really giving that protection to the technician. You know, making sure they use the right tool and they birth themselves correctly and things like that. You know, those health and safety things built into work things. I think we're also going to see the rise, I mean, Gartner were talking about the decline of the app and the rise of the virtual assistant. I mean, those of you that use Cortana and Siri, I think we're going to see that in the next five years, you know, with some intelligence. And my colleague, uh, Patrice Emberline, she talks a lot about the millennial sort of generation, so the next generation of technicians, you know, sort of people that are coming in that are used to getting information from their, their phones and from their devices. You know, they're going to expect a lot more sort of support, intelligent support perhaps from these sort of virtual assistants. So I guess my prediction is, yeah, we'll be driving around in our little cars. We'll probably have virtual translators. I'll be chatting away to my colleague in Japan and they'll be answering uh, all my questions simultaneously being translated. And yes, my driverless car or my, uh, my vehicle will be whizzing me around London so I don't get any parking fines while my parts are automatically dispatched uh, real time to my customer. But yeah, uh, <laughs> hopefully I'll be around then to see all that. I think um, the one thing I'd add to that, that, that vision you've just painted there, Mark, is our, our engineers will probably be doing the same, but we'll just add into the fact that uh, they'll also have a, a portable 3D printer in the back of the, the van, so the van will be... And this, this actually, as although I say it with a little bit of jest, um, this actually is, is a very feasible vision of the future for your field service. You know, your, your connected device reports it has a fault. That connects to your, your FSM system which automatically dispatches your engineer. Um, his car drives him there, so he's able to uh, do any, any work, any reports, etc. whilst he's on vehicle. Um, as he's driving there, the, the, report fault, the reported fault is a, a worn flux capacitor, um, and he's got one printed in the background in his car. Um, so when he arrives on site, um, he just pops into the, the 3D printer, pulls out the flux capacitor, goes in, fixes it, and uh, job done. You can imagine 
the first time fixed rates soaring with such history. But um, I, th I think that you know the, the future is incredibly exciting. I think just to go back to uh, Chris's initial question, what excites me most about IoT potential and the impact on field service, I, I see it just fundamentally aligned to this um, this whole servitization movement. Um, you know, it, it's servitization is a long, long, confusing word. Um, a lot of people ask me exactly what it is, but the move from away from transactional based uh, relationships with manufacturers towards service based outcome based approach i think is is something we 're going to see um, and i 've heard you know in terms of you know the next industrial revolution, the fourth paradigm um, these are big big calls, but I think they 're absolutely spot on i think we 're going to see a huge change in the way that business is done across the early part of this century. Um, and I think IoT is going to be fundamentally driving that. Ah, oh, absolutely, totally agree. I think um, again, I come back to the business, the case study. You know, I think IoT is going to be a game changer for service profitability, without a doubt, um, because it allows us to get our visibility, so we can plan our work. And I think it's going to be a very different sort of model from a scheduling, optimization, and resource management point of view. Chris. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Um, Mark and Chris, I think uh, these two could chat all day around around this topic, but I hope, hopefully the audience um, had some you know, interesting insights. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the recording will be made available uh, in the next few days, so uh, please have a look in your inbox for that. Um, and any further questions or anything, please reach out to Mark and Chris. Um, we can send their details as well. Um, so thank you very much for joining. Um, we hope to see you on the Service Max webinar again very soon. <laughs>